Amen. Good morning, everybody. Who is ready for marriage challenge session one? Oh, come on. I think we can do just a little better. Who's ready for marriage challenge session one today? My name is Christian. This is my beautiful, lovely wife, Yesenia. We are married a year and a few months now. Right? Just check it. What we're going to do is we're going to go over the marriage commitment. So as you're standing, I want you guys to go ahead and pull out your packets. This comes in your marriage challenge packet. It's a booklet that is going to help you to follow along on all of the messages and the great things that we're doing during marriage challenge. Great teachings in here. But if you turn to page number two, you'll see the marriage commitment and you'll see the dating and singles commitment. Go ahead and open that up and follow along with me. And we're going to go over this together for just a moment. I'm just going to read through it. We, Christian and Yesenia, you'll put, insert your names, not our names, commit ourselves to invest in our marriage by coming together to do the following. Number one, attend all sessions together as a couple. This is going to be the best four weeks for your relationships that you've ever had. Don't miss any session. Number two, write down at least five positive things about my spouse and share them during the marriage and relationship challenge. I could do that right now. Let's see. Number one, you're beautiful. Number one, you're so sweet. Number one, you're so smart. Number, I mean, oh yeah. Did I can't say number one a bunch of times. <laughs> I'm just so mesmerized. That was 1A, 1B, 1C, number 2A. No, just kidding. <laughs> I'm just so lost in your eyes. I got to write them down. That's a key. I was brainstorming. <laughs> I'm just practicing my homework. But let's write those down. Don't just say them verbally. Write them down and share them with your spouse this week. Number three, have a date night once a week. Three people were excited about that one. Have a date night once a week. And you know what? You don't have to break the bank for your date. Just make it memorable. Make it special. Do something that you'll remember. Number four, singles, close your ears. Have a time of intimacy at least once a week. <laughs> married couples only. That is a married couples only. All right. Thank you for that. Number five, never go to bed angry and forgive one another. Don't go to bed angry forgive and we'll learn more about that in these four weeks number six complete all the homework assigned from the love and respect workbook the workbook was also included in your packet written by one of the world's leading teaching voices on marriages and relationships you you are going to want to apply yourself in this workbook trust me and number seven invite one more couple to experience this marriage and relationship challenge just off the top of your head who can think of at least one couple to invite next week. Who can think of somebody? I love it. I love it. Let's think of them. I'm going to read this. As we invest in our marriage by following through with the marriage and relationship challenge, we will see God do the miraculous in our marriage and begin to experience companionship, unity, family life, and the fullness of God's blessings as God created it to be within a Christian marriage. Married couples, are we ready? Yeah. All right, now let's go over to the... Dating and singles. How many dating and singles are in the place today? Come on, guys. Who, who's dating and single in this place? All right. So we're going to go over the singles and dating commitments. Um, I, and state your name, commit myself. I, Yesenia, commit myself. Oh, you're not oh, single. I'm you're not, not single. single. I'm not single. You're married. Old Yesenia. <laughs> I'm just. <laughs> I'm not. I'm married. I'm married. Commit myself to invest in my future marriage by agreeing to do the following. Uh, one, attend all mar marriage and relationship challenge sessions. Two, identify three attributes of a godly spouse I want to cultivate in my life for my future marriage. Three, maintain purity and integrity according to God's standards until married. Four, complete all the homework assigned from the love and respect workbook. So whether you're single or you're dating, like this is an investment for your future marriage. So what you do now is investing in your future marriage. You're, it doesn't happen when the day you say I do, Pastor Marco says that all the time, it starts right now. Everybody say right now. Right now. Number five, invite one more dating couple or single to experience a marriage and relationship challenge. Bring them with you. And six, I will attend 
the Werewolf Outreach courting classes when I begin dating and I promise my future spouse to attend premarital classes when becoming engaged. Who says that they can do that? All the six, yeah? Only three people? Come on. All right, we could do this, we could do this. Okay, so as I invest in my relational growth now, I am planting seeds for my future marriage. I expect all my relationships while single, dating, or engaged to be God-honoring and prosperous because of the investment made here at the Wayworld Outreach Marriage and Relationship Challenge 2022. All right, who's ready to sign? Let's do that. You're going to pull out your pens now and go ahead and sign your commitments. Married couples, sign at the bottom. Singles and dating, you can sign at the bottom. And let's get ready for session one of Marriage Challenge. Today, we're going to be learning about the ground rules for a successful marriage. Before you see it, I want to give a big Way World Outreach welcome to session one speaker, our very own Pastor Marco and Lisa Garcia. Let's welcome them forward. Thank you. I, first of all, I just want to thank everyone for being here today. And these, you may be seated. And these next 30 days, we're going to learn how to have successful and healthy relationships. It, it's something we can learn. And relationships that are healthy and done right are more enjoyable than anything in the world. We were created to be in relationship. When God created the whole earth, the sun, the moon, the flowers, the trees, he created animals, he created all of that first, and then he created man. Everything was created for man. And the Bible says that he created man in his image. Why did he create him like him? This is why he created man like him to have, there's a reason, to have a relationship with him. He created man like him to have a relationship with him. Man was created to have a relationship. He was created for relationship first with the creator, with God. When God made man, it was really interesting what he did. He He looked at the whole earth. He goes, man, everything's good. I created. Then he put man in a specific place. God created a garden. It's called the Garden of Eden. Really beautiful garden. The Bible describes the Garden of Eden that had beautiful trees. And it had trees that produced fruit for food. So in this garden was beauty. And in this garden was provision And in this garden was God's presence. The word Eden means this, the garden of Eden. Eden means this, pleasure. So it was a garden of pleasure. It was a garden of presence. It was a garden of God's power. Everything was there, provision, power, pleasure. God put man in a perfect environment that everything he needed was right there in that relationship. But after he created man and he places him, he, he says one more thing. It is not good for man to be alone. And what he was saying, I created man to have a relationship with me, but I want man to have a relationship with one of his own kind. The word it's not good or it's, it's, or we could say, it's bad for you to be alone because you were created not to be by yourself, disconnected, all separate, be lonely. You were created for relationship. Relationship with your brothers and your sisters. And if you get married with your husband or your wife, it's not good for you to be all alone. It's not good for you to be disconnected. It's not good for you to be separated. You were created for relationship. Say it with me. I was created for, I would find my greatest joy, my greatest happiness in relationships. I love going place. I love going to eat. Anybody like going to eat? But I don't like going to eat by myself. It don't taste the same. Right? There's some restaurants I love to go, but I want to go with my partner, my wife, my best friend. 
Now, when I go with her, even the food is not great. The company is. And we're good. I was created for relationships. You can have relationships that are healthy, that are satisfying, that cause joy and great happiness and fulfillment. You can have those. But you're going to have to learn how to do it. Just because you've gone through a lot of pain, a lot of hurt, maybe a divorce and difficulties, and you feel like, man, my relationships have ended in failure and hurt, doesn't mean they need to continue ending that way. We can be healed from the past, and we could be skilled for our future. How many believe we can learn how to do this? How many believe that we can learn, come on, how to have some relationship skill? Could it be that you're waiting for a husband and God says, you're not quite ready. Because you think your husband is going to make you happy. And God is saying, no, let's make sure you're happy without him first. Make sure you're okay without a wife first. So when they come into your life, they're not the source of your happiness. You're finding that contentment with your relationship with God and even relationships with others, brothers and sisters in the church, in the Lord. Be, understand this, God, you can have a happy life and you can have great relationships with a purpose. And the purpose after it's all said and done, me and Lisa have come together as a team. But we've come together as a team and God's given us five children and a big part of our assignment is to reproduce God's character in our children. You have to understand this. You'll reproduce who you are. You're not successful if you're not reproducing the right reproduction. You guys understand that? So we're here. I'm here to learn how to do relationships. I'm here to improve. I'm here to be transformed, to become more like God, more loving, more forgiving, more kind, more patient, so I could begin to reproduce that in other people. Your greatest happiness Will, will be when you learn it and you train it. You're learning and you what? We want to learn it and train it. Now we could learn, we don't have to learn how to fail. We don't have to learn how to destroy our relationships. We don't have to learn how to scream. We don't have to learn how to cuss. You learn that. It's so funny when I hear people that don't know English and then they try to talk English and the first words they use are bad words. And then I see people that don't know Spanish and then they try to talk Spanish and the first words that you learn are bad words. It's so funny how we're attracted to bad words and we're not, a, we don't, we, because we don't know how to use healthy words. We're going to learn how to use healthy words. Well, this is my wife, Lisa. How long have we been married? 32 years. 32 years. 32 and a half years. 32 and a half. 32 and three quarters of a year. I'm just kidding. You're right. Right. Um, Lisa. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to ask you a question, and I'm going to answer my question for you, too. What do you like about me? What I, oh, I love I have this. to pick one thing? Yeah, one thing. Golly. Can I say, like, a few things and then? Uh, just two, then. <laughs> okay, one is you're funny, right? Okay. Everybody knows that. I, I do like that about you. You're a handsome man. You're smart. You're, you, okay, I could go Ooh, on and on and on. feel good now. Yes, you're funny. I okay. love to laugh with you. Okay, that's it. <laughs> Keep going. That's good. <laughs> well, I, what I love about Lisa is I love that she's stable. Like, she's emotionally a stable person. Uh, she's not up and down. I love that about her. If there's one thing that's consistent in my life, it's God and it's her. <laughs> if there's one thing that's up and down, it's me. <laughs> you. She tells me I'm like too extreme. extreme. Like one, it's like really good or really bad. And if I talk to her and I say, how, how like, let's say I'm speaking. I go, honey, how do you think I did? She goes, it was good. It was great. She don't ever say great. She just said great. She said it was good. And I go, let's, uh, let's, ex let's bring some better adjectives on this. It was super. It was amazing. It was wonderful. Oh, it just rocked my world. <laughs> but she said it was good. And I go, okay. That means it wasn't so good, right? 
But, but me, I'm like, it was awesome or it was horrible. There's like no middle ground for me. So, that, you know, we, as we go through life, we're, we learn each other. And there's some challenges that we face with each other. And it takes a lifetime of commitment yeah. to work through those challenges and mature. Our marriage is better now because we've worked through a process to get here. It doesn't happen overnight. We're working on it. But I will, I'm really honest with you. I love Lisa more now than I did before. I, I, I not only that, I know how to love her better now than I did before. I'm a lot more mature than I was before. That's true. But we've had to go through a lot of nonsense. And we've still got a lot of nonsense. It's me, mostly me, me. You know, but we go through it, but it's a process. Say it with me, it's a process. It's a process. So now we're going to enter into 30 days of process. Uh, at the end of these 30 days, you're at least going to have four solid teachings on relationships. Uh, the teachings you're going to hear, you're never going to hear again. They're going to be once in a lifetime opportunity. If you take everything that you're learning, you write it down and you practice it, this is what I guarantee you, you're going to be changed. Your future relationships are going to change. You'll be restored. You're going to be healthy. And you're going to be able to receive love and give love again. God wants you healthy when, it, at, at, when it's all said and I do guarantee you this. At the end of this, you'll be on a different track that you were on before you started these 30 days. But understand, this is the first day. We got another four weeks. I want you to be committed to this process and I guarantee you, you're going to see results. How many are ready for new results? Bet good marriages are become great marriages. Marriages that are rocky are going to be built on marriage. They're going to become marriages on the rock. There's marriages that are ready for separation and divorce. And we're believing that they're going to be reunited and restored marriages. Singles are going to get prepared for the greatest relationships in their future. It's going to happen right now. God is saying, I, it's not about a timing, it's about preparation. When you're prepared, I release. Get prepared. How many want to get prepared for release of God's blessing and relationships and responsibility? Okay, honey, let's, let's pray. You pray and let's pray us into this moment. I need your help right now. <laughs> Father, I thank you, Lord, for this day, for this time, for this, this session that you have set aside just for this moment, God. I ask you, Lord, that you would... Uh, be with the people, be with their hearts, God. Lord, I thank you, Father, that they're ready to receive your word. And God, I thank you that that pastor is ready to give the word. Father, I thank you, Lord, that you bless each one and let us learn to apply in our life, Lord. And we thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Okay. Today we're going to be talking about ground rules, ground rules for a successful marriage uh, and, and relationships. The word ground rules, mean, is, is the, the definition is basic principles or rules of conduct. And, and I warn you, rule breakers don't win or succeed, they fail. So when God's given us parameters to live by, they're to protect you and lead you to success or a win. In 1 Corinthians 9.27, it says, no, I train my body and bring it under control. That means I'm taking personal responsibility. I'm going to get my mouth under control, my, my mind under control. My body and my emotions don't tell me what to do. I tell my body and my emotions what to do. I bring my body and my mind under control. Then after I've preached to others, I myself will not break the rules. That means I know the standards. I know what I'm supposed to do. I know the ground rules. I'm going to make sure I don't break the ground rules because if I did break them, I would fail to win the prize. That means if I don't live according to the ground rules, I could want the results. But if I'm outside the parameters of the ground rules, understand it doesn't matter who you are. You're not going to succeed. You're going to fail. You're not going to win the prize. You're not going to get a win. You're not going to get the results that you want. Not because they weren't available for you. Is that you fail to stay within the parameters of the ground rules. So we're going to learn how to have successful marriages. I'm going to make this real simple. I'm going to give you six ground rules. And ground rule number one is very simple. Attend all sessions and do all homework. The amount of effort we put in 
will determine the level of success we achieve. There's going to be four sessions. The person or the couple or the individual that attends all four sessions is going to get more than the one that attended three or two or one. Don't get upset if you're not getting the results that someone else is getting if they're willing to put in the full effort. Full effort leads to full results. Does anybody want to get the full results? Finishing is better than starting. I am so proud of everyone online, everyone that's here for starting. Starting is great, but I do know this, almost anyone can start a marathon. All you need to do is sign up and put on some shorts. You can start the race, look really good, ready to take on the world, but finishing a marathon is difficult because why after you run your first mile, you're gonna, your body will start speaking to you and telling you, you can't go anymore. Who cares? No one's looking at you. Just stop right now. You could stop in the middle of your process, but understand, if you stop in the middle of your process, there'll be no development, there'll be no improvement, there'll be no transformation, and there'll be no rewards. Rewards are for those that finish. And Ecclesiastes 7a says this, something completed is better than something begun. Does that make sense to you? Something completed is better than something begun. I graduated from Cal State San Bernardino with a bachelor's degree in business and a concentration in organizational management. And someone asked me, Marco, what is the greatest thing that you learned with that degree that you went through four or five years of school and what was the greatest lesson you learned? And this was the greatest lesson I learned. I learned how to start a process and complete it. And if I could start a process and complete it, there's no assignment that I cannot achieve. Why is starting and completing a process important? Because in between starting and completing, there's a lot of resistance, there's many obstacles, there's difficulties. What gets you through that? It's a commitment. I'm not just a starter, I'm a finisher. Are there any finishers in this place? You're going to be tested. Next week, you might have a flat tire. Pastor, I got a flat tire. You curse my tires. I didn't curse your tires. It's just somebody's going to get a flat tire. Are you going to use that as an excuse of why you couldn't come? Next week, you and your husband might have the, or, your, or yourself, whoever you're arguing with, might have the worst week you've ever had. What are you going to do? Are you going to say, throw in the towel and say, oh, well, I guess this one session, it didn't work. Are you just going to throw in the towel? No, you come with your arguing, arguing self. You come with your cussing self and get back here for the second session. You still got some cancer. We need, come on, we need, more, we need some more chemotherapy. Okay, just keep coming. Keep showing. You'll never get results in an area you're not consistent. We must learn how to finish processes that we start. We will never have a blessed and successful marriage if we quit during the process. God never, the only thing you should quit is quit sinning. But stop quitting on your process. Stop quitting on God. Stop quitting on your education. Stop quitting on your business. Stop quitting on your family. Quitting. In, in, in Galatians 6, 9, it says, and let us not get tired of doing what's right. Why does it say don't get tired of doing what's right? Because we have a tendency to get tired of doing what's right. You get tired of exercising. How many know that's right? We get tired of eating right. How many know that's right? We get tired of doing the right thing. So don't get tired of doing the right thing. Get tired of doing the wrong thing. For after a while, say it with me, after. To get transformation, God's not interested when you're just getting great results. He's interested in transforming you. And a lot of the results that you're going to get are going to be a process of time and consistency. So we have to put in time. And after a while, this is what it says, we will. That means it's a guarantee. If you stick with it, you continue doing what's right. You keep showing up to the sessions. You keep doing your homework. You keep studying. You keep reading. You keep saying the right things. This is what he's saying. After a while, you will reap a harvest of blessing if you don't get discouraged and give up. There's an if. If you don't give up and you don't talk yourself into giving up 
or you don't let things discourage you from stopping the process of moving forward, this is what God is saying. I guarantee you, you will reap a harvest of blessing. You have a blessed life. You have a blessed business. You have a blessed marriage. You have a blessed ministry. If you could get through the process. Many of us have dreams and goals, but we don't like the process. And if you don't follow through on the process, even if that dream and goal happen, you couldn't keep it or hold on to it because you don't have the character to hold on to it because it's through the process that you develop the character to stay in a position, not visit it. Ground rule number two, apply all biblical instruction for relationship success. There is always a path to success. All we have to do is follow it. Relationship knowledge and skill is the most important skill to master because it leads to the greatest happiness and peace we can experience in life. There's a, in any endeavor that you want to succeed in, there's a path or there's steps or there's instructions. I want to learn how to succeed in every area of my life. Don't get jealous, just get the instructions. Many of us are envious of others that are succeeding in certain areas. And you're thinking, well, I wish I could be them. And God says, you you don't have to be them, but you could get the results that they're getting because I'm given the instructions and they're available for everyone. You'll never get the instructions if you're a rule breaker. I want to do what I want to do and I want to follow what I want to follow. Then you're going to get your results. You're not going to get God's results. Look at this. There's a success formula. It's very simple. Say with me, success formula. This is it. Hear and obey. Say with me, hear and obey. In Luke eleven twenty, 20, it says this, but Jesus said, the people who hear the teaching of God and obey it, hearing and applying it. I'm hearing it and applying it. The first instruction we got, just show up to all sessions and do your homework. Hear and applying. Those that hear and apply, look what the Bible says about them. They are the ones who have God's blessing. They're the ones that get the results. They're the ones that God, they have God's blessing. In other words, blessing means happiness. They have God's happiness. Does God want you to be happy? Does God want you to have miserable relationships? No. So we say, just follow my instructions and I'll show you how to have happy, successful, and healthy relationships. It means they're the ones that are experiencing the rich and satisfying life that God offers. They have favorable outcomes. They have success. They have overcoming power. That means that every one of us can overcome. Every one of us can succeed if we just follow these two steps here and obey. Say with me. Hear. It's just follow, know it, learn it, and apply it. If we learn it and apply it, God is saying, I'll give you the blessed life you've been looking for. You can have it. Successful marriages are built. There's no luck in this. Marriages are built by learning and applying the success principles and teachings of the word of God. We're going to get our teachings from the infallible word of God. God's word is 100% accurate. I dare you. Say, I'm not a believer. I dare you for the next 30 days, just practice everything that you're being taught. And I guarantee you, you're going to get the results you've always wanted. In Matthew 7, 24, it says, anyone who listens to my teaching and follows it is wise. Like a person who builds a a house on solid rock. We build our marriages, we build our families, we build our lives by practicing teachings. If you don't like the life that you've built, then you have to look at the material that you're using. And God is saying, I've given you my word so you could build a strong marriage, a strong ministry, a strong business, a strong life. But here, here the way. Like a person who builds on a rock. Verse 25, Matthew 7, 25. Though the rain comes in torrents and the floodwaters rise and the winds beat against that house, it won't collapse because it's, it's built on bedrock. What he's saying is storms will come, temptation will come, 
difficulties will come, adversity will come against your marriage, against you, against your business, against your ministry. But he guarantees those that build their house by hearing the teachings and doing them, I guarantee you, your marriage won't collapse. It won't fall apart. It's going to stand the test of time because it was built on a solid foundation. How many understand we could build something solid? When you get married, when you get married, you're, you're, you're marrying a fixer-upper. Let's see if there's a fixer-upper. Let's see if fixer That's what you married right there. Have you ever even gone to those model homes? When you go to the model homes, you want to buy it because it's so decorated, so beautiful. It's a model home. And then you find out when they take you in to do the paperwork, all that don't come with it. Like that? You have to buy that too? You got to buy everything. And well, that's another $300,000, I know. But the house could be that. And what you end up doing is you buy the potential, but you have to invest in it to get it to maybe look like that. But you don't even get that. This, it could turn into this. I know not that's the biggest house, but it's the same house. It could turn into something beautiful and every improvement that you make and every session that you're coming to, you're building your life. You're building your character. You're not going to be fixed overnight, but you can improve overnight. You can improve this moment and every improvement that you make or you allow God to make in you and your marriage or in your life, this is what's going to happen. You get to live in it. It's for you. So successful marriages, ministries are built. Ground rule number three, forgive. We will forgive everyone for everything they have ever done to us. We will not hold on to grudges. That word forgive, this is what it means. It means to let it go. How do we know we let it go? We're not talking about it or dwelling on it any longer. We need to get good at forgiving. Because we're really good, we're really good at holding on to grudges. The Bible says love does not keep a record of wrongs. Today's your day to let it go. It means also to stop seeking revenge or payback. It means to bless them. Some of us should be working, we should be working for the mafia. Because you're a great collector. If someone owes you because they hurt you, you make sure they pay. I mean, we got some lady gangsters up in here. And your husband said, that's my wife, she's a gangster. You could cut someone with your words. You could give someone the silent treatment. Your husband, is, he already knows. You, some of us don't even say nothing. You just have that look. And he goes, what's wrong? You know what's wrong, stupid. You've been married to me for years and you don't know what you did wrong. I've gone over this. Well, please tell me. I'm not going to tell. You better figure it out yourself. And until you get your act together, don't expect nothing. You're really, you're, you know how to make people pay. Now, how do you know you're forgiving someone? You're no longer seeking payment. You just let it go. You really have forgiven someone when you could actually bless your enemies. I know that's hard, but that sets you free. There's a quote. The weak can never forgive. Forgiveness is the attribute of the strong. The weak can never forgive. Forgiveness is the attribute of the strong. I heard this saying too, is unforgiveness is like drinking poison and expecting them to die. Unforgiveness will poison you, poison your spirit, poison your future relationships. I was talking to Lisa. I go, how could I best illustrate this? And next time I ever teach this, I will actually bring someone up here that has handcuffs and show me, show you what unforgiveness is. Unforgiveness is like being handcuffed to your abuser. And you go to sleep with them. They're on your mind. You're connected with them. And what they're doing is you're connected with them. And they're not allowing you to love, be loved, give love. They're always in the way. The greatest thing you could ever do is forgive someone and set yourself free to enjoy the rest of your life. <laughs> Forgiveness is good for us. Say it with me. It's good for us. It's good for our physical, emotional, and spiritual health. There's studies that have shown, the, this is what said, the good news, studies have found that the act of forgiveness 
can reap huge rewards for health, lowering the risk of a heart attack, improving cholesterol levels and sleep, reducing pain, blood pressure, and levels of anxiety, depression, and stress. Whoa. Could it be that all the sickness and all the stress and the depression that's in your life is caused by unforgiveness? I, I talked to, I, I, I prayed for, for, with someone. It was probably a year or so ago, maybe a year and a half ago. And I prayed for them in the North Hall. And when I prayed for them, they're crying and, they're, um, and they were talking about their life. And we're praying, but after, while I was praying for them, something strange happened. I just saw that lady, I was praying for her, her hands started shriveling up like this and her voice got deeper. And I started looking at her, what is this? And then I started realizing, wait a second, this is a manifestation of a demon. And when she did that, I could hear the growl of that spirit that was in her. So this is what I did. I did what Jesus did when he faced a demon, a demon, demon possessed person or a demoniac. Jesus says, what's your name? And when Jesus said that, the demon says, legion, for we are many. He gave his name. And this spirit, I did the same exact thing. I'm just copying what Jesus did. I go, what's your name? And the, the, the spirit said, cerebral palsy. Cerebral palsy. What I did was, the next question, I asked that spirit that was naming itself cerebral palsy. That's why her hands were shriveled up. I go, how did you enter? And he said, I entered through the unforgiveness she has for her husband when he betrayed him, her. I go, so you entered through betrayal and unforgiveness? So then what I did was I brought the, the lady back and I go, honey, did you hear that? That there's a spirit that actually entered you through unforgiveness? And she goes, yes. I go, are you ready to forgive and be set free? I go, have you been diagnosed with cerebral palsy? She goes, no, I have no symptoms of that. So that means that there was a spirit that was there of sickness that was going to manifest in her future because of a decision she was making not to forgive today. Wow, so unforgiveness is super demonic. This is what we did. She forgave her husband. It was hard because this is what you have to learn. Forgiveness is not an emotion. Forgiveness is a choice. You can't wait until you feel like forgiving them. You got to forgive them because it sets you free. It makes you whole. It allows you to be healthy. You understand that? It allows you to be loving. It allows you to be joyful. You cannot be unforgiven and loving. It's going to be one or the other. And when you forgive others, love prospers. When you refuse to forgive others, hate grows. Do you want to become more hateful, more bitter, more depressed, more angry? Or do you want to become more loving, more kind, and happier? How many want to become that? Well, the only path to that is forgiveness. Forgiveness is a choice. Ephesians 4.31 says this. Let all bitterness, wrath, and anger, and clamor, perpetual animosity, resentment, strife, fault finding, and slander be put away from you. He said, let that stuff go. Let the perpetual animosity, always angry, always upset. Let the resentment go. Let all the fighting go. We're always fighting. Let it go. Fault finding. Because when you're in this mindset, you can't even see the good in anybody because once you're in that mindset or on that track of thinking, all you could see is wrong. Be put away from you, along with every kind of malice, all spitefulness, verbal abuse, malevolence. If you're constantly cussing and slashing people's tires and <laughs> breaking stuff in your car, and keying people's car, there's something wrong with you. And God says, let that go. You can let, you, what's so good about it, God commands you to let it go, and you can. But it says in, math, in, in, in Ephesians 4.32, it says, be kind and helpful to one another. You could do that. Tenderhearted, compassionate, understanding, forgiving one another readily and freely. Make it easy. Be a forgiver. Let it go. It's going to help you. 
You cannot have a great relationship if you're holding on to resentment to anybody, with anybody. If you're mad at your mama, it's going to affect your relationship with your husband. It's going to ref, uh, it's going to reflect in your relationship with your coworkers. It's going to overflow. What's in your heart will contaminate every relationship. Let's go ahead and get set free from that. Ground rule number four: no blaming or name calling. We cannot have happy marriages and lives saying hurtful words. In 1 Peter 3.10, says, the scriptures say, if you want to enjoy true life and have only good days, then avoid saying anything hurtful and never let an eye come out of your mouth. The scripture is saying, if you're saying hurtful things, you're not going to have a joyful life. If you want to begin to have a joyful life, let go of all the blaming, all the criticizing. In every relationship, there's someone that's the blamer. Say, what are you, Pastor Marco? I'm the blamer. It don't matter what goes wrong. I I have a tendency, if I lose my keys, I'll say, Lisa, where'd you put my keys? (laughs) The other day, which was just a couple days ago, I I, I gotta watch my words. But Lisa's so mature about this stuff. She just laughs at me and she goes, okay. Okay. And she ignores some of the stuff I say. We're, we're driving on a road, and, and we're, it's a familiar road now in Tennessee. We just got Tennessee, but we've hit this stoplight like three times. And so we're coming up on this light, and she goes, where are we? I go, honey, see those houses, those box houses? This is Rosa Park Street. We're right here where we've always been. We just make a left. We're, we're there. She goes, oh. She don't say nothing. She don't say like, hey, you know, that was a little, little, little sharp, you know, hey, relax. I mean, it's just, I was just asking about the street. She don't say nothing. The next day, we're on the same street and I'm like, where are we? <laughs> same exact stop sign. She goes, those box houses, can't you see this Rosa Parks? And she just starts laughing. I go, you got me, girl. But someone has to be the mature person in a relationship. Someone has to be willing to let it go and not make a big deal about everything and understand God will make sure he takes care of you. The joke ended up being on me. It's so funny how when you're critical about others, you end up, you could be critical about that. If you don't watch it, you end up being the same exact person you're criticizing. How many understand that? It just has a way of backfiring on you. Blaming and name calling only leads to more blaming and name calling. Our words and attitudes were always boomerang. Someone say boomerang. In Matthew 7, 4, 5 says, don't pick on people. Jump on their failures. Criticize their faults. Unless, of course, you want the same treatment. There's a principle here. Whatever you throw out is going to come back to you. If you don't like how your relationship is today, Maybe we need to start with the words that you're using or the seeds that you're planting or the boomerang that you're throwing. Because whatever you're throwing out is going to come back. If you're blaming and you're criticizing, you know what's going to come back? More blaming and criticizing. Look what it says. Unless, of course, you want the same treatment. The critical spirit, that critical spirit has a way of boomeranging. So if you're critical, what's going to come back to you? If you're blaming, what's going to come back to you? If you're cussing, what's going to come back to you? If you're hurting people, what's going to come back to you? I love this because now we can determine what comes back. If I want good to come back and I want love to come back, if I want kindness to come back, I just need to go ahead and throw it out. If I want encouragement to come back, I just need to throw it out. I tell Lisa every day, you're so beautiful. You're so pretty. You're amazing. You're so kind. I tell her this all the time. And today, you know why I got boomerang back? You're so handsome. I love you. I got a boomerang. I love that. Could it be in these next 30 days, you just change your language and you change your life? It could. Ground rule number five, or these last two, sobriety. I'm going to make just a simple statement. It's not wise to get drunk. Someone's going to be real quiet here. (laughs) 
because it's the value of the world. But because, because when you're drunk, wise, not wise, you don't, you're not under the influence of wisdom. I would even say this. You might be under the wisdom of bad decision. And it could be almost stupidity. Have you ever got drunk and just being stupid? Well, my, my, my biological father, this is the reality. He was the nicest guy. Everybody told me he was the nicest, kindest person you'll ever meet until he got drunk. My dad was five foot seven. But when he, when he got drunk, he was six foot seven. He would weigh 150 pounds, but when he got drunk, he was at least 250. Solid muscle. My, my dad was a good looking guy. He had, he had a college education. Um, his family was well to do, but he had a drinking problem. He could not fix his marriage and still he, until he realized I have a drinking problem or I have an addiction. Maybe in these next 30 days, if you ask God to help you, you could get, let, get set free, get healed of the addiction, become sober and become wise. And start experiencing the relationships you should have. When my dad got drunk, he was not, was not only six foot seven, 250 pounds and a gangster. He was an abuser. He'd come home and beat my mom up, punch her in the face, put guns to her head, give her black eyes, accuse her of all kinds of crazy things. He also thought he was a playboy when he got drunk. He was always picking up on women while he was drunk and he was a womanizer when he got drunk. Eventually, because of the bad decisions that he made under the influence of alcohol, he ended up going out one night, got in a bar fight and got killed at the age of 32 years old. He died in a gutter, not because he wasn't, didn't have potential, not because he couldn't be a good father. He was under the influence of alcohol. In Proverbs 20, 20, verse 1 and 2, it says, Wine and beer and strong drink and alcoholic beverage made from grain make people loud, mockers, uncontrolled, grouses and brawlers. It is not wise to get drunk and be led astray by them. So scripture is saying, be careful that you're not being led or influenced or under the influence of drinking and drugs. And that's a normal thing because you're not even supposed to drive a car under the influence. What makes you think you could lead a family under the influence? Right? I'm asking you, try 30 days of sobriety. Give it a shot. You might be saying, Pastor, I don't, I'm not no alcoholic, I promise you. <laughs> I can stop anytime I want, guarantee that. Okay, start right now. I will tell you this, guys. I'm, I'm not trying to take your fun away from you. I'm trying to develop you and help you get the character so you can lead your family, get wisdom. Because if you, if, if you have a drinking problem or a drug problem, this is what's going to happen. And it's going to turn into a relationship problem, a marriage problem, an emotional problem, a financial problem. It's just going to bleed into everything. So let's right now troubleshoot. And for 30 days, let's practice sobriety. All I'm telling you, God will help you with this. Who the son says free. God will help you. It's a good thing. How many believe it's a good thing? In Proverbs 23, 29, it says this. Who gets into fights and arguments? Who gets hurt for no reason and has red bloodshot eyes? This is the answer. People who stay out too late drinking wine, staring into strong drinks. So be careful with wine. It is pretty and red and it sparkles in the cup and it goes down so smoothly, especially margaritas, when you drink it. But in the end, it will bite like a snake. This is the problem. When we're under the influence of alcohol, this is one thing that can't happen. You can't be under the influence of God. In Ephesians 5.18, it says, don't get drunk 
with wine or beer or don't get high. Well, I didn't say heroin. Don't, don't, don't take meth. <laughs> For that is wickedness, corruption, and stupidity. But be filled with the Holy Spirit and constantly guided by him. So it kind of clears it up. If you're, if you're under the influence of that, you cannot be under the influence of wisdom and the spirit of God. God wants to guide you, lead you to a successful life, a successful marriage, a successful, raising a successful family. But we can't do it if we're under the influence of some type of substance abuse. How many understand that? Today's someone's day to acknowledge, okay, you might even not even think I got a problem with that. It's okay. Let's just practice 30 days of sobriety. And man, if you mess up, that's okay. Just start over again. But practice this. And I guarantee you this, you're going to have better conversations. You're going to be more present. You're going to make wiser decisions. And this is what's going to happen. You're going to grow. And then you can start working on the areas you need to grow in. Get that? Does that make sense? Last thing, ground rule number six, no talk of divorce or separation. As long as we're working on a divorce, we're not working on reconciling and improving our marriage. What we speak is what we give life to. Divorce, so where did that happen? Where, where did that come from? Divorce is an invention of man created for hard-hearted and unforgiven people. And I said, Pastor, I got divorced. We're not here to talk about your past. We're here to talk about your future. There's some couples in here that right now you're on the verge of divorce and separation, but this is a problem. You talk too much about that instead of talking about your solutions. And as long as you're talking about divorce and working on a divorce, this is the truth. You're not working on reconciliation and you're not working on improvement. You can't work on both. So in these next 30 days, we're just going to stop talking about it. We're going to do our homework. We're going to show up. We're going to change our conversations to start getting different results. In Matthew 19, it says, he said to them, Jesus said to them, Moses, because he said to them, Moses, because of the hardness of your hearts, permitted you to divorce each your wives. But from the beginning, it was not so. The truth was marriage was created to last a lifetime. In 1 Corinthians 7, 11 says, a husband is not to divorce his wife. In 1 Corinthians 7, 39, it says, a wife is bound to her husband as long as he lives. If her husband dies, she is free to marry anyone she wishes, but only if he loves the Lord. So in each one of these circumstances, God is saying, work on what you have in your hand. And why do you need a lifetime commitment? Because it takes a lifetime to work on this house that's a fixer-upper. Right now, and I, there's still a lot of work on Marco. A little bit of work on Lisa. Mostly on me. But every day, I'm growing. I'm learning. And because of that, we're having a better relationship now than we did a year ago, two years ago, ten years ago. Because there is improvement that's happening. It took a while to get here. We had to go through processes, difficulties, struggles. But we can get through this. What I want you to do for this, just one minute, I want you to take a look, and hopefully they got the video, of a little toddler. She's speaking to her mother, and she's saying, Mama, she's giving Mama some relationship advice, and she's telling her, we need to use better words in a relationship. And I think we can learn from this little four-year-old girl. Take a look at this video. Let's see if they got it. There she goes. All right, let's put it up so we can hear it. Can't hear it. Can't hear it. Can't hear it. Still can't hear it. And we got the, okay, okay, let's, let's, let's see if we could get it to hear. Nope, this is not working. And plus we have the other green screen over it too. Are we... Are we working on this? I mean, can, we, right now, first thing, let's eliminate our back screen. Praise the Lord. Okay, so we can't get it. Someone help me up here. I mean, can we get this thing or not? Okay, we got one piece done. Now let's go back and let's get some sound on this. We have no sound. Nope. 
Okay, all right, there we go. Let's start over the video. Let's start over the video right here. Okay, put it loud. Put it loud. All right, go ahead. Try not to be that, that high up to be friends. I want everything to be low, okay? Okay. Just try your best. I, I don't want you and my dad to be replaced and, and me again. I want you and my dad to be placed and settled and be friends. I'm not trying to be me. I just want everyone to be friends. And if I can be nice, I think all of us can be nice too. I'm not trying to be mean, but I'm trying to do my best in my heart. Nothing else than that. I want you, Mom, my Dad, everyone to be friends. I want everyone to be smiling. Not like being mad. I want everything to smile. Especially when I see someone, I want them to smile. Especially Nana, everyone. I want everyone to smile. And if that's for my dad and you, Mom, I think you can do it. I think you can settle your, your, mean, your mean heights down a little to short height. <laughs> then it's both, okay? I'm not trying to be mean. I'm not trying to be a bully. I'm trying to be steady, steady on the floor, not way down. Just steady. On straight, on the middle where my heart is. My heart is something. Everyone else's heart is something too. And if we live in a world where everyone's being mean, everyone's gonna be a monster in their future. What if? If there's just a little bit of person and we will eat them, then <laughs> no one will ever be here. Oh, there There'll it goes. Monsters in our place. She preached better than me. Oh my God. <laughs> you, got, you can stop right now. Let's all stand up. Every How many receive from little four year olds wisdom? I just want you to not be mean. I'm not trying to be a bully. I am something, and everybody's something. <laughs> and if we be, keep being mean, we're going to be monsters and eat everybody and there'll be nobody here. <laughs> Is there wisdom in that? Because when we're mean to each other, we're destroying each other. We're hurting each other. And I love what she said. Can we just be steady? Be established. We're going to grow. Some of us have to grow more than others. I'm going to get that. Right? I need to grow. Understand this. If you're first time here, I'm definitely not one of those te teachers or pastors that ever try to give out the persona that I'm the perfect guy. Because I know there's so many areas that I'm growing in. And, and that's what keeps life exciting anyways. I've not arrived. I don't think any of us have. And no matter how good life is or how bad it is, it could become better. But it happens through personal transformation. We're not here to change others. We're here to allow God to change us. So let's start off with the most important thing. Life is all about this one subject. And this is the subject. Receiving forgiveness and given forgiveness. If you can master this skill, you would mastered life. Because when you receive forgiveness and you give forgiveness, you're allowed to love. You're allowed to be happy. You're allowed to think right. You're allowed to have a good night's sleep. You're allowed to have, or you could create healthy marriages and relationships. You can do it. But first, Let's just admit, number one, man, I've messed up. But admitting you've messed up or you've sinned or you've done wrong, it's not to condemn you. It's for us to realize, okay, I admit it. And if you'll admit it, this is what God will do. He'll develop it. He'll fix it. He'll improve it. You'll never 
ever improve in an area that you're in denial in. It could be anything. It could be, you know what, I'm not a finisher. I'm going to start being a finisher. Or I hear it and I don't do it. I'm going to start, it's going to be tough. I'm going to start hearing it and doing it. Husbands, maybe you don't want to do the homework and your wife say, honey, let's do the homework. Let go of pride. I don't like to read. Well, let her read it. Be there. Go through the process. Get the full, full investment. Get the full results. It's going to take some work. It's not going to be easy. Your greatest enemy is your present thinking, your present habits. And if you keep doing and we keep doing this, what we've been always doing, we're going to keep on getting what we've always gotten. It's time for change. And let it start with me. Or you say, let it start with me. My, me. If I can change, look at this. If you allow change in your relationship, your marriage has become 50% better at least. As single, if you could allow God to transform you, God could release some relationships into your life that he always wanted to get you. Let's start with the relationships we have right now with your mom, with your dad, with your coworkers. Work with them. Yeah. Forgive them. Let it go. So I'm going to, this is the call. If you want to be forgiven and you want a brand new start, God's so ready to forgive you. Or number two, you're saying, you know, I want, for, I want a forgiveness, but also I need to forgive someone. You know, if you came into this room, if there's somebody on your mind that gets on your nerves, you don't like them. It could be your spouse. It could be your neighbor. It could be your mom. It could be your dad. But understand, you are now still, if you don't forgive them, you're handcuffed to them. And they'll be with you in every relationship here to your future. They'll not allow you to think, not allow you to breathe, not allow you to succeed. They'll keep holding you back. You'll lose jobs because you'll be impatient and you'll be angry. You'll lose relationships. You wonder why, why does this keep happening? There's a forgiveness issue. It's time to let it go. Some of us are gonna be healed today because you're gonna forgive and you're gonna become healthy emotionally, mentally, and even physically. You don't have a blood pressure problem, you have a forgiveness problem. I know you have an anxiety pill, but maybe you just need to forgive and that will fix your anxiety, all goes away. It can happen today. I'm gonna to count to three. If you're saying, Pastor, and I want you to understand, this is a decision. I want forgiveness today and I want a new start. Number two, I need to forgive someone for sure. It could be somebody you're with, it could be somebody that's not in this room, it could be somebody that hurt you a long time ago, but you gotta forgive it, forgive them. You got to let it go. This is your opportunity for a brand new start. The strong forgive. This is your day. One, if that's you, I want to I receive forgiveness. I want to give forgiveness. When I say three, I want you to raise your hand. One, two, three. I want to forgive. I want to receive forgiveness. Awesome. I see all those hands all over the place. I want those. Now, understand this. We need to be intentional about our growth. No growth will happen without intentionality. You got to put effort in it. If you're saying, yeah, that's me. I don't feel like I'm ready. It's not a feeling. It's a choice. It's time to get disciplined above your feelings. Say, it doesn't matter. I know I need to forgive or I need forgiveness. I need a new start. I need a new beginning. Or you might be saying, man, that sobriety thing really hit me. I want God to set me free. I want him to give me new desires. Come the way you are. God's the one that changes you. We're not here to dog anybody. We're not here to put it. We're just saying there is an option that you can be free. You can start over. I want those to raise their hands. Do one more thing. Will you leave your seat and come forward real quick? If you raise your hand, this is a step of you're saying, I'm leaving my old life. Come on. I'm leaving the unforgiveness in those seats and I'm walking towards joy, peace, a relationship with God. Come on, let's give them a hand as they're coming forward. Ask your neighbor, couples, if you've been upset with each other, you need to come up here together. Come on, couples, come up here together. The beginning of having a healthy life, a healthy future is receiving forgiveness and give her forgiveness. It's time to let it go. Forgive your mama. Come on, forgive your, come on, forgive the, the last church you came from. Forgive your leaders. Forgive yourself. Receive forgiveness. Today's your day. Come on, let it go. Move forward. Make this the first day. Come on, the rest of your life. Understand, this could be it, but it's a, your choice away. Nothing's going to happen if you don't make the choice. 
church. Let's give a hand. Come on. There's families. Come on. There's come on. There's young adults. There's mothers. There's fathers. They're saying, I want my brand new start today. Awesome. Ask your neighbor, you want to go up there? I'll go up there with you. I want to give. I really believe there's someone out there. You're, so, you're supposed to be up here. And there's like a war within you. You say, man, we should be up there. This is your day for a new start. Receive forgiveness from God. Receive a new beginning. Come the way you are. Come with the brokenness. Come with the hurt. Come with the damage. Just come. He's the healer. He loves you. He's not here to judge you. He's here to help you. Awesome. Okay. All right, we're going to pray. First of all, we're going to receive forgiveness. And I want you to understand this. You can be forgiven because Jesus paid the price with his life. He died for us while we were still sinning, doing our thing. He loves you. You can be forgiven because the price was paid. You could be forgiven. He paid, he loves you. He forgave you and made a decision for, for, to forgive you before you ever decided to ever do right. The Bible says that Jesus died and suffered for our sins, our wrong, our offenses, while we were still sinning. We're doing our thing. We don't want nothing to do with God. And God says, that doesn't change my heart towards you. I love you. And his greatest desire is that you would come to him so he could forgive you, to restore relationship with him. He wants a relationship with you. That's all he wants. And every decision that we've made that's been sinful, what we've done is we've walked away from God. And we walked away to hurt, to pain, to addiction, to anger, to abuse. And God's been looking at all the pain and the hurt and the mistakes you've made and the anger that's developed in your heart. And he's saying, son, daughter, aches me. It hurts me that you're out there hurting because I don't want you hurting. I want to restore you. I want to set you free. And I want you to know this, no matter what wrong you've done, receive forgiveness today. There's nothing no one's done in this room that God can't forgive. Receive it. And then what I want you to do is not only receive forgiveness, receive Jesus as your Savior. And say, from this point on, I'm going to follow you, Jesus. I want to be your student. Mentor me, train me, be my father, be my, my guide, direct me. And then you're going to receive forgiveness for yourself too. Don't leave here with a guilt trip. When God forgives you, he erases your past. You're not going to leave here with a past. You're going to leave here with a future. Are you ready to receive your future, your new beginning, your new start? I know I did it. That's then. This is not. That's, that's BC. I'm starting over. Okay. Let's pray together. Bow your heads. Close your eyes. Repeat after me. Say, Jesus, I thank you for desiring a relationship with me. Forgive me for all my sins. I know I should have been the one that was punished for the wrong I've done. But you loved me so much. You gave your life. You took my place. Thank you, Jesus. Right now, I receive forgiveness. Freedom from all the addiction. Healing from pain. And I forgive everyone that hurt me, abused me, walked out on me. I let it go. And I'm asking you, Lord, save them. Transform them. Do a miracle in them. But from this day forward, I'm following Jesus. Fill my heart with your love and your peace. I am saved. I'm a new person, headed in a new direction. In Jesus' name, I pray, amen. Let's give the Lord a big hand. Come on, church. Come on, let's give the Lord a hand. I want to thank you guys. This is our first session. We got three more sessions. I guarantee you, every session is going to get better and better. We just laid a foundation. Do your homework. Get your packets out there. Get your packets. A minor investment. 
for a lifetime of transformation. If you want prayer, come up here. I'd love to pray with you. I will be on this section over here. If you want to say hi to me? I'll be there for a few moments. If you're here for the first time, I'd love, sure love to shake your hand. God bless you. Man, we have three more weeks, but the most important part is all the homework. I want to make sure that right now, make sure we have coverage here, that everybody's covered. So I might need some more leaders up here. I need another 50 leaders up here. Make sure we got everybody covered here.